All right. Very good afternoon to all of you who are tuning in today. Welcome to our session, Nature-Based Solutions in Indonesia, The Power of Nature. I'm Junis Yo, Executive Director at EcoBusiness. We are Asia Pacific's leading media and business intelligence organization dedicated to sustainable development and responsible business. Well, we are proud to be hosting this dialogue today with Givaudan, one of the world's leading media, excuse me, one of the world's leading manufacturers of flavors and fragrances. And this is as part of our ongoing efforts to cover important sustainability topics across the region. Today's focus is on Indonesia, Southeast Asia's largest economy and the fourth most populous country in the world. With Indonesia's status as one of the largest archipelagos with over 18,000 islands, the country is particularly vulnerable to climate change impacts. All eyes are on Indonesia this year as it hosts the G20 summit, and we do expect to see more coming out of its presidency 2020 to announce its roadmap and policies focused on a more fair and just climate transition. Now, as the world tightens the reins on carbon emissions as well, the countries are publicly announcing their carbon uh, reduction plans alongside the Paris Climate Agreement. Indonesia too has, had, has set its own net zero goals uh, to achieve that by 2060. Well, how Indonesia is going to get there though is the name of the game today. And we're excited about the prospect this brings to a country so rich in biodiversity and wildlife. And amid the global call for urgent climate action, experts have highlighted the power of nature-based solutions or NBS. And this, would, this should help the countries to meet their climate goals as well. The governmental body driving policy and science, the IPBES, issued its global assessment report on biodiversity and ecosystem excuse me, services recently. And it estimates that nature-based solutions can provide up to 37% of the mitigation needed until 2030 to achieve the Paris Agreement targets. Indonesia itself has an NBS potential of about 1.4 gigatons of CO2 equivalent per year approximately one-fifth of the global potential for NBS. This makes it potentially a leading player in this field. Carbon solutions are becoming the exciting um, part of what NBS can do, but of course the devil is in the details. These solutions need to be properly managed and scaled quickly enough to support local and global climate goals. And while estimates show that Indonesia's voluntary carbon credit market um, could achieve a value of about four to six billion US dollars by 2030. There remains to be seen um, as if this lacks an, a bit of a lack of knowledge on NBS as well as its implementation. So today we are thrilled to be presenting this platform in which proponents of nature-based solutions will seek to uncover the potential for Indonesia. We will discuss the, the opportunities for the country if it successfully scales NBS. We, we will also discuss the barriers, but also solutions that play to Indonesia's strengths. Nature-based solutions work best when done collectively. So we will talk about the best ways to synergize the stakeholders' interests, both horizontally and vertically. Sincere thanks again to our partner, Givaudan, who are supporting our work to deliver the session. Before we hear from our esteemed panel of speakers, I'm going to now hand it over to Dave Housen, Global Head of Res uh, Responsible Sourcing at Givaudan, who will uh, provide us with a short keynote, pre a keynote presentation. Dave, over to you. Many thanks, Eunice, and uh, hello and good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Eunice said, my name is Dave Housen. I'm the Global Head of Responsible Sourcing at, uh, at Givadon, and I'm based in the, our site in Vernier in Switzerland, in Europe. So just to say many thanks for the opportunity to talk to you today, this important event, about Givaudan's perspective of our role in nature-based solutions to tackle this you know, huge challenge we have in front of us with regards to climate change and business. So, let me just, here we go. So what I'd like to talk to you today about is, uh, well, briefly introduce Givaudan, go into a little bit more detail about who we are in case uh, some of you are unfamiliar, uh, and then look at our purpose and sustainability approach. So give an overview uh, of how we tackle um, or how we integrate sustainability into our business and, and, and provide a bit of detail on some of our key goal areas. And then get into the nature-based solutions. So the what and the why from our perspective and the role of sourcing and agronomy in our um, implementation of that and, and the remediation of that. 
Okay. So we're a global industry leader. So Jibberon are a global industry leader. We create game-changing innovations in food and beverage, as well as inspiring creations in the world of scent and beauty. Uh, we operate uh, globally uh, in an expanded marketplace as well, market space of, of flavor and taste, uh, functional and nutritional ingredients, and as well as fragrance and beauty. So we're a player in, in, in many different markets. So we operate on a business to business le level uh, and we offer our products to global, regional and local food, beverage and consumer goods, fragrance and cosmetics companies. So around 50 percent of our sales go to multinational customers uh, and 50 to local and regional. Um, we've got a truly global footprint and we're sourcing well over 10,000 natural raw materials from around 100 countries. So you can say we've got a we've got a huge footprint, really. Um, and it's highly likely that most of you listening uh, and watching this presentation have already today used a product that contains a, a Givadon ingredient. So it's a yeah, it's, it's highly likely. I know I <laughs> I certainly have as well already this morning. OK, so with regards to our um, purpose and sustainability approach, um, sustainability really sits at the heart of our business and it's led by our purpose and it's this it's creating for happier healthy li healthier lives with love for nature let's imagine together so our purpose acts as a as a compass really for guiding our strategic decisions uh, every day through our four key goal areas so creations nature people and communities and i'll go through those in a little bit more detail so as you can see these are the the four pillars of our corporate purpose, which we launched at the end of, of 2019. So each of our four goal areas gives us a specific ambition. For example, you know, showing our love for nature in everything we do, enabling um, more people to live happier, healthier lives through our creations, uh, ensuring all communities that benefit from working with us, and that Givadon is a place where our people can uh, love to be and grow professionally and personally. And as you can see in the middle there, underpinning all of these is our journey to becoming a certified B Corp, which we began last year. So achieving this particular certification, so B Corp certification, um, will be externally verified proof that we are really truly living our purpose and fulfilling these goals every day. So let me just go into that uh, in a little bit more detail. So as part of each of our purpose goals, we've set a series of specific and very bold ambitions from doubling our business through creations that contribute to happier, healthier lives by 2030 to our ambition to become climate positive before 2050 and our goal to replace single use plastics across our sites and operations with eco friendly alternatives by 2030. We've also set very bold ambitions around care and inclusion, uh, and we've set these you know, similarly uh, challenging ambitions to source all materials and services in a way that protects people and the environment by 2030, as well as working hard to improve the lives of the millions of people that we touch uh, and in the, in the areas that we're sourcing uh, and where we operate. However, coming out of this in, in, in the context of the conversation today about nature-based solutions, really, we want to focus on, you know, before 2050, our supply chain will be climate positive, and that's a huge challenge for us. So we're working already very hard on setting out those plans in order to um, meet that. But of course, you know, we are in a very challenging environment uh, with regards to uh, um, the, the, the nature of the environment. So one of our main focus areas is in our approach to decreasing our scope three emissions. And, that's, and one of the areas that we focus on for that is sustainable procurement of the sustainable procurement of our ingredients. So there are many facets to this, including pursuing a zero deforestation policy, targeting regenerative agriculture, supporting renewable energy sources in the supply chain and promoting supplier innovation. So as we know, direct or indirect deforestation increases the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere by removing the carbon sink and, and uh, carbon ecosystems from the Earth's surface. So we, with regards to our sourcing approach, we expect our suppliers to avoid deforestation and land conversion for agriculture and ask them to commit to the uh, no deforestation, no peat, no exploitation. So the N, uh, NDP principles as part of our responsible sourcing policy, which we updated uh, just last year. 
So it's supporting us in our aim to source um, products that are deforestation and conversion free. So our involvement in standards such as the RSPO, uh, which is very obviously very close to your hearts there in Indonesia, helps us to move to our supply chain, uh, helps us to move our supply chain to um, a deforest, deforestation free sourcing. So when we look at their nature based solutions, let's look at the what and why. So what does all this relate to? Uh, so how does all this relate to uh, the nature based solutions and what do we mean? So you guys, many of you guys have probably seen this. So this is the definition put forward by the WWF, focusing on how nature based solutions can help to address the triple global challenge of biodiversity loss, climate change uh, and equitable development. So as Junis has just mentioned, according to the IPBS and their global assessment report uh, recently, then nature based solutions could provide almost 40 percent of the climate change mitigation to 2030, which would then meet. Uh, or towards meeting the, the Paris Agreement. And obviously that's then, when you consider the number of potentially threatened species and the number of wild species in, in, uh, that's called out by the, uh, the report, around 50,000, then we can see that that's both significant and extremely challenging. You know, we think of then, you know, a third of the world's population, you know, rely on these wild species and around, and that includes around 70% of the world's poor. So it's, you know, it's a, it's a significant challenge. And it goes to show that we as a global business or one of the global businesses, we've got a vital role to play in the improvement of this situation through our programs and actions on the ground. You know, it's vitally important that we do, you know, we go in the right direction and, and, uh, uh, and we're following this um, program to, to make these improvements. So with regards to um, nature-based solutions at, uh, at Givadon, sorry, excuse me. Then alongside rapid decarbonisation, of course, then these nature-based solutions are essential to deliver a zero, a net zero future, you know, set out in our, in our um, purpose targets. Solutions such as reforestation, forest conservation, or regenerative agriculture enable emissions reductions, as well as the capture uh, and storage of emissions to the atmosphere. So in line with our bold climate ambitions, we're looking to implement further community-based initiatives that would contribute to the reduction of CO2, and to the remove carbon from the atmosphere. So we've got a working group together between the Givadan business and also our Givadan foundation. So there's these representatives and as well as external advisors, we're proposing a variety of new initiatives that would have a meaningful impact on Givadan's carbon footprint in several, in several key supply chains of natural perfumer and, flavor, and flavors ingredients. So these include things like tree planting, improved agricultural practices, uh, measures to uh, protect the natural ecosystems. All these require a deep understanding of the context and the landscape. And we would therefore implement these programs in close collaboration with local stakeholders, including on the ground in Indonesia. For example, by reintroducing trees in agricultural land, we can bring about a wide variety of ecosystem benefits, such as soil regeneration, regulation of temperature and humidity, as well as biodiversity regeneration. So a qualitative program, that's well integrated into the local ecosystems and the communities is also a key success factor in bringing benefits over the long term. So ensuring these benefits are sustainable for us and for the local community. And of course, in addition to this, we recognize that our footprint of sourcing, as I mentioned in the, in the slide earlier, you know, from around the world, it requires us to source in a responsible way. We've been doing that for many years and we, re and we recognize as well with our uh, recent uh, purpose ambition to source all materials and services in a way it protects people and the environment. We launched last year in 2021, we launched our updated and strengthened responsible sourcing program, which we call Sourcing for Good. And I'll just go on and talk about that in a little bit more detail in the next couple of slides. So traditionally, Givadon has focused our sourcing responsibly program on naturals, our natural raw materials. But with our, this ambition, this increased ambition that, in, that extends beyond materials or raw materials to services as well. Um, it means we've evolved and enhanced our approach. So it's spanned across our entire supply chain spend. So it now includes what we call synthetics and also our indirect materials and services. So all of our categories of third party spend are under the sourcing for good umbrella, which is significantly uh, a significant scope increase, but also it really then reinforces our approach to being um, a purpose driven a global corporation. 
So this program, as I said, is is we we call this sourcing for good. And so you know some 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 key aspects of this. So it provides a solid foundation of trust and compliance between you know that's built between our procurement function and our upstream supply partners. And then building on this, we're able to develop these transformational collaboration, uh, collaborative projects in key supply chains, whilst also recognizing the theme of supply chain transparency that's significantly important for our customers and consumers. So we architect the, architected the, the program, the Sourcing for Good program into our pyramid to, ex, to clearly explain uh, the different levels and the different activities that we do through the, through the, the program. So looking at the active level, so this is about then, you know, the right level of supplier engagement and activities and efforts, you know, so it's about breadth versus depth as we move up. So at our active level, we make suppliers aware of our responsible sourcing practices through our sharing our responsible sourcing program uh, pro policy. Uh, at engaged level, we engage in the due diligence process, uh, including risk and uh, impact uh, assessments. At the committed level, we work with, with our suppliers to secure the essential uh, materials and services that we need through, through verification tools. And at the advanced level, it's we're implementing the collaborative and transformational projects that I mentioned before. So, you know, the further up the pyramid we go, the deeper the activity and thus moving from breadth to depth. So the materials and services, you know, begin the source responsibly journey at the active level, and then is further, further embedded uh, when, you know, the assurance proof points are gathered through the other levels. But the long-term success of sourcing for good is largely dependent on the full integration of responsible sourcing practices in the day-to-day -day operations of our procurement team. So this is a journey of continuous improvement approach, uh, of course, but it's also helped by our by the fact that we're supported by inter our internal procurement expert teams, such as our agronomy team, and I'll and I'll touch on that now. If I can. Hang on. Here we go. Oops. Let me just go back up one slide. There we go. So for us, so for Givenon, agronomy is the science of the cultivation of land, soil management, and crop production. So Givenon, we, we're very lucky we've got an external, an internal um, team of agronomists with a mission to support the business in five key development areas. So those are soil and climate, plant material, plant nutrition, plant health, and farming practices. So in a little bit more detail, as I said, we're very fortunate at, at Givadon because we have these agronomy experts that are spread globally, as you can see for the map. Here we go. So we have a team of eight in, uh, in agronomists, including one joint venture. We have around just under 30 botanical projects on the go. Um, and you know a number of different external partners as well, including you know trial field tw over twenty trial fields, and you can see you know we're spread pretty much globally. So this is you know around de deploying projects, you know, research projects, but also in the, the the agronomist team are implementation uh, partners for existing responsible sourcing uh, and procurement projects. And so the opportunities we have. Uh, to adopt these nature-based solutions in some of our challenging supply chains. So, you know, one of these examples is um, patchouli in, in Indonesia. So let me just quickly talk about that. Um, so on the Sulawesi Island, you know, uh, fuel wood is the main source of energy for transformation of the leaves. So, um, and, and you know, the patchouli oil is one of our iconic ingredients. So we've, we've got a big focus um, in Indonesia on the ground. You know, we're, we're, we're working with and training more than a thousand patchouli producers working with 320 operators, you know, in environmental friendly agriculture distilling practices. You know, we, you know, this delivers, you know, carbon, reduced carbon emissions and, and um, the impact on the natural resources by the renovation, you know, which is you know, hugely, hugely improved from when we started working then, you know, back in you know, the middle of the, of the 2000s. So, you know, this is about driving a fairer society as well. So we're supporting this, all of our, um, our total uh, demand is covered by this collection network. We're using um, traceability tools as well. So this is a this is a significant project, and it's only one uh, one example. So when we think about, you know, we we and we're working in many other examples. 
But in fact, we recognize, you know, Gibraltar recognize that there's a long journey ahead for all of us. Uh, but conversations like this one that we're having today um, on the impact and the benefits of nature-based solutions, of course, will ensure that business like ours stays on the right path looking forward. So uh, I know a bit rushed at the end there, but um, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk to you. And uh, I very much look forward to the discussion. So over to you then, uh, Junis. Thank you, Dave. Well, well done. Uh, great. So now let's get get the show on the go. We've got, um, oh, excuse me. Yes, we've got a, a list of um, exciting topics to discuss. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to my esteemed colleague, Megan, who will run the show for us. Over to you, Megan. Thanks, Dave, and thanks, Junis, as well, for setting the scene of our discussion this afternoon. Um, as Junis mentioned, I am Megan C, Director of Partnerships for EcoBusiness, um, and I'm very honoured to be your moderator today. So just as I introduce our speakers, I'd like our attendees here really to answer a poll that we have prepared for you, which we'll take into the panel discussion. So um, Ben is going to just get a poll question up. The question here is, what is the biggest challenge in scaling nature-based solutions? Uh, and, um, option one, finance gap. I see everyone gunning for finance gap. Um, lack of understanding of nature-based solutions, uh, lack of high quality or integrity carbon credits, and last but not least, inadequate supportive government policy and regulation. So just to see, um, you know, people start to respond, very, very responsive uh, attendees here, very good. Um, it's now my great pleasure to introduce our panels and of distinguished panel speakers this morning or uh, afternoon, actually. So first up, we have Eka Chandrabwana, uh, Director of the Indonesian Ministry of National Development for Planning, or BAPENAS. We have Ronnie Mark, Managing Director of RS Group, and also Kavita Prakashmani, CEO of Mandai Nature. Thank you, Eka, Ronnie, and Kavita for taking the time to be with us virtually today. Um, just as I go into our first question, actually, um, our audience, please do stay engaged in a conversation using the chat function um, that it will be at the side. We'll also be having a Q&A session as well with our speakers later. So please do type your questions in the chat box as we go along with this conversation. And if you're sharing about the dialogue on your network, please also do um, you know, add us at Eco Business and use our hashtags as well. So with that, I'd like to pose the very first question to the speakers, and that is, what is one key reason, in your opinion, on why nature-based solutions matter? And I'm going to go along the line and introduce this panel speakers. So Eka first, Ronnie, and then Kavita. Um, Eka, please provide your insights on this. Hi, Eka, are you there? Okay. Oh, you might have to unmute, Eka. Thank you. Oh, uh, yes, that's right. <laughs> uh, the speakers, remember okay. to please unmute Perfect. yourself as you speak. Can you hear me, Hear me, Megan? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. That's right. Okay. okay. Uh, actually, uh, now uh, I want to share with you uh, related about uh, what Indonesia do related about nature-based. Uh, uh, nature -based, yeah. Uh, uh, we have uh, so uh, I mean uh, I have to answer about that uh, challenge uh, the the challenges related uh, the question or not or uh, I can share uh, what we do in Indonesia. Hello, hello. Please. To the second bit later on, but maybe, hi hi. If I answer this uh, first question, sorry, are you? Is there a tech problem? Can you hear me properly? Yeah. Is it is it just me or? Okay, okay, okay. No, I, I can hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, I can okay. hear you. Yeah, if uh, you could answer the first one first, and then we'll go into the Indonesian bit. Um, just after this first round of question, if that's okay with you. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, related about the challenges about the nature. Uh, uh, base. Uh nature based uh, because uh, now in Indonesia maybe have uh, the same problem with the others because of the pandemic because the pandemic uh, you know, uh you know as we know about the emission reduction uh, because of pandemic is very uh, uh, sharply but now uh, about the economic recovery maybe we have a ch a new challenges now because uh, uh, the rec economic recovery can uh, increase about that emission uh related about uh wait sorry can i share about uh my my presentation uh, megan 
uh, maybe a little bit later on, if, if you will let me finish this uh, part with uh, Ronnie and Kavita. And okay. then as you go on to the next question for you, maybe you can go on to that. That's okay. 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 Yeah. Okay. I'm going to go on to Ronnie now then. Uh, Ronnie, what is your one key, or key reason in your opinion on why nature based solutions matter? Sure. Um, thank you, Megan. And thank you, um, um, uh, Eco Business, for inviting RS Group and myself to share today. Um, I'm Ronnie. I'm the managing director of RS Group. Um, so, yes, I think. Um, as we've read even in Eco Business's um, um, articles and many that um, nature-based solutions can provide up to one third, 37% of the climate mitigation that is needed to keep um, planet warming within two degrees by 2030. So, but unfortunately, despite that, um, we also know that um, nature-based solutions accounts for less than two or 3% of total climate financing. So it's a hugely underfunded um, area that needs a lot of capital. Um, and together with that, also, you all know, nature provides a lot of cold benefits, which means food, uh, water, air, uh, flood preventions, um, uh, uh, weather, um, wet, wet, wet temperature regulations, and all of those benefits that now increasingly um, people are estimating economic value too. So that means that there's a huge economic value to protecting nature. So for our group, um, we've had a focus on um, nature-based solutions, or we call it natural capital since 2019. Uh, one of our first initiatives around that is a $3 million blended finance window um, around nature-based solutions, giving grants to um, basically encouraging business models in Southeast Asia. I can talk a bit more about that later. But I'll stop here for now. Thanks. Thanks, Rani. And Kavita. Uh, hi, Megan, and thank you for having me. Just to add on to, uh, to what Ronnie was saying, I think at Mandai Nature, the conservation organization working in Southeast Asia, we see nature-based solutions as being really critical, not just to address climate change, both mitigation and adaptation, but also get investment into conservation, whether it be species or it be ecosystems or habitats. Uh, that we all need to protect uh, and also get economic benefit into the communities, local uh, local communities, indigenous peoples who are at the front line of conservation and, and climate. So nature-based solutions uh, are really beneficial for the triple benefits of uh, climate, nature and, and, and people. And we would love to see more of these projects done uh, to maximize that impact. Thank you so much, Kavita. Uh, and I, I'm just going back to the poll a little bit. Um, and I see actually the responses are quite even across the, the field, really, um, across all finance, lack of understanding and lack of you know, high quality carbon credits uh, and government policy as well. Um, so maybe, Eka, I know that you haven't got a chance to talk about Indonesia, but this is your chance now. Um, so going to you, um, in 2017, uh, the Ministry of um, National Development Planning from where you're from launched a low carbon development initiative to put low carbon development at the core of Indonesia's next five-year development plan. And in 2020, Indonesia released the first ever sustainable development plan, RPG MN 2020 to 2024. So with this, um, and also seeing, you know, the, the poll we had earlier in terms of the challenges that people um, say um, is a barrier to implementing nature-based solutions, what role um, does NBS play in Indonesia's sustainable development plan and how have these challenges and opportunities been identified in this nature-based solutions aspect. Um, pa, I go over to you. Okay, thank you, Megan. Uh, role NBS to Indonesia, uh, we committed to implement a, a national development agenda in line with the nature-based nature solution. Therefore, Bapenas launched and mainstreaming LCDI, including NB, and, uh, national-based solution issues in medium-term plan, 2020-2024. Uh, there we uh, more specifically to be implemented into the national priority. We have uh, seven uh, national priority, and one of the national priority related about that uh, low carbon development, uh, which is uh, NBS. Uh, in addition, uh, NBS can help region the urgency and fundamental environment challenges by bringing the ecosystem uh, surface back to the region and rebalancing re region. Uh, relationship with their surrounding area by uh, accelerating and implementing uh, of NBS, decision makers can help the region adapt to affect the climate of climate change. Re can reduce uh, urban heat, uh, island effect, and cooling uh, needs the in building clean air, manage water, etc. Uh, NBS, uh, however, 
is a crucial, a crucial to ensure more actively sustainable development. We in uh, about the challenges about uh, how to implement that. Uh, you know, uh, uh, maybe we have uh, the world for our uh, fourth uh, most populous country that achieve impressive e e economic growth. However, maybe uh, there's a lot of cost that maybe we can uh, we have to handle about uh, how uh, it, the cost. I think that uh, the my, my answer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eka. Uh, and I'm going to go on to Ronnie for the next one um, because we know that you know I guess nature based issues is very crucial to attack to to tackling the climate change challenges that we have right now, especially with you know the 20, 30, 2050 uh, mark looming here. Uh, but we know that the concept of investing in nature is relatively new for the private sector, and despite you know very high investment capabilities, the percentage of private finance following into nature-based solutions remains quite low at about 14% of the total funds going into these solutions. So why is this so? And also, you know, what, what are some kind of innovative business or investment models that can help catalyze the markets um, to create confidence in nature-based solutions? Sure. Um, in terms of the why, I think there's a host of reasons um, that makes these um, challenging but um maybe just to name a few one is the lack of investable pipeline and you probably hear a lot of that um for investors to be in interested um first of all i think um they would need to see certain risk adjusted returns which i think for these nature-based solutions is a bit difficult and this is where blended finance um comes in to help um to to uh, uh um um uh, raise the risk adjusted returns to a level that um, investors will be interested in. Um, other reasons uh, could, could be that this is purely a pretty uh, nascent sector where um, where there's not a lot of understanding, there's not a lot of um, standards to measure, there's not a lot of standards to assess the risk a part of it, or to evaluate, to analyze. Um, and so I think it's not something that investors are familiar with. So if they have to choose, they might choose with, uh, other areas that they're more familiar with. And the third one is talents. I always think that there's a lack of people, entrepreneurs in these areas, whether it is to start these ventures or it is on the bank, bank side or on the asset manager side or on the even investor side to probably understand and analyze mm -hmm. um, whether it's the potential benefit and impact that comes versus the uh, financial risk and rewards. Um, so th th those are like in short some of the challenges. Um, but I think it's always easy to give an example um, or to explain um, because as you said, it's complicated. And while conceptually people understand, but I think giving a live example may make it easier to understand what is an example of these innovative business models. So I wanted to use Fair Ventures um, Forestry as an example. This is a for-profit social ventures that um, uh, the Irish groups uh, supported through our conversions window. So we gave them a feasibility grant um, uh, earlier in, in the year. Um, so what it, they are is um, it is it is a for-profit social ventures that focuses on forest landscape oh restoration in Indonesia. And they take on an agroforestry oh, type don't. model um, that aims to conserve forests, but also um, uh, restores degraded land um, in what they call buffer zones, which is areas where there's high deforestation rates. Um, and they work very closely with the local communities to engage them and therefore in return provide uh, income and livelihoods and at all at the same time um, having a robust business model that can generate ton of financial returns that can sustain sustain the um, running of the business as well as account to the different stakeholders. Um, so the revenue streams from this uh, will be mainly say uh, what they call sustainable timber, so from from the from the trees, um, and but they also grow a lot of cash crops alongside these trees in between in between or in between the trees, um, and so that's the kind of basic agroforestry model. But also they have a small portion of revenue that they're thinking of coming from carbon credits. We can talk a bit more about that, but I think given the uncertainties now in Indonesia around this space they only estimate to be less than 10%. So they can only really uh, assume a very small portion that comes from that. Um, in terms of scale, they're looking at targeting at least 100,000 hectares of land um, in West Kal Central Kalimantan, sorry, Indonesia, 40,000 of which are, are actually degraded land, 60,000 are natural forest. And in total, they estimate around 6 million tons of carbon sequestration that can be possible if they can achieve that. 100 communities, over 20,000 people. So you can hear from all, there's a lot of impact from the environmental climate 
social livelihoods communities perspective, um, but also obviously from a nature conservation and uh, restoration perspective as well. So our grants to them was about 400,000. It was a feasibility grant that allowed them to design a fund. Um, they were targeting up to 50 million, but I know they're probably starting at like 25 to 30, but eventually maybe a $50 million blended finance fund um, uh, from grants from debts from equity so a mix of different tranches that can allow them to finance um, uh, this kind of work across the, uh, the different regions that they've identified in uh, central Kalimantan in Indonesia. Thanks, Ronnie, for providing all that information. A, a lot to take in there, and very vengeance as well. You know, obviously, it's very close to Eco Businesses Heart. You are our, our winner for this year's Deliverability Challenge as well. So, thank you very much for highlighting them here. Uh, but, Eka, I wanted to go to you for this one as well. Uh, in terms of the Indonesian perspective, um, you know, what have you seen any kind of new innovative business or investment models um, that you see that can th that can have a big potential in you know helping to catalyze the markets for nature based solutions? Okay, thank you. Uh, we know that uh, investors uh, will be careful uh, and see about the new invest, uh, investment sector. Investor will be interested and if the uh, there are a good prospect about in the future. So uh, we as a government uh, give a, uh, several uh, like what we call it, like an incentive to investor to invest the green solution, uh, green, green, uh, so nature-based solution. Uh, about the financing, uh, government has issued various uh, green instruments such as a green bond, green sukuk, SDGs bond uh, that uh, has a commit to encourage the role of invest investor to contributing about that environment-based uh, development, including NBS. In addition, uh, the government uh, provide uh, various tax incentive for, for investor who will invest or open the green-based industry in line about uh, with the government commitment such as we have a uh, industrial estate in batang uh, uh, which, which uh, become a center of electric vehicle ecosystem in indonesia that's uh, what we uh, government do to attract the investor to the uh, green uh, uh, green project thank you thank you Eka. Uh, and, and on to you, Kavita, I know that you probably have also uh, something to comment as well in terms of, you know, government regulations and initiatives as well. But speaking about Mandai Nature, you know, we know that it's done, is doing quite a lot, you know, for nature as well, taking to help to develop nature-based solutions for climate, um, focusing particularly on the protection, mm -hmm. restoration and sustainable use of ecosystems as well, with a very big goal to protect and restore 100 thousand hectares of natural ecosystems. Uh, what would be a key setback in achieving this goal? And then on the flip side, what is key to achieving this goal? Uh, thanks, Megan. Yes, absolutely. Our main uh, agenda is Mandai Nature and our charter is to be protecting wildlife and ecosystems in Southeast Asia. Um, and so we're really looking at how we can work with local partners. And this is very often smaller local uh, NGOs and organizations that are working on the ground in the field in these uh, amazing ecosystems with these species that are threatened. So we do aim to get to 100,000 uh, hectares, uh, but that is primarily in the sense of saving those habitats for the species that we want. But interestingly, nature and climate are part of the same solution, they're flip sides of the same coin. And so as we look at protecting these habitats, one of the best way of getting sustainable long-term sources of uh, financing is the climate market. Um, and uh, protecting these habitats will also uh, result in uh, mitigation of carbon sequestration. And so how do we look at whether it's forests or peatlands or grasslands or, you know, or, or mangroves? How can we bring some of that uh, protection into the climate agenda and hence uh, look at the investment and the uh, community impact that we have? So for example, you know, there are projects that we work with in terms of, uh, say, bird protection songbirds or cockatoos or or even turtles, and they all need uh, habitats, whether it's the Philippines or it's you know Myanmar or, or it's Indonesia. Uh, but I think the challenges for us are many fold, and some of them is uh, definitely having clear regulatory support, uh, which in the context of uh, the new uh, agreements around the corresponding adjustments in Article Six are proving a little difficult. Still, we have clarity, and hopefully the next COP will provide some some clarity on what can be uh, developed and what can be counted, and what's voluntary and what's compliance markets. 
Uh, but the second is also around how do we get investment and uh, link the into the markets, the smaller organizations. The whole point of setting up uh, carbon projects is quite time intensive and money intensive and also technical. Uh, so whether it's feasibility studies or PBDs or project uh, development or monitoring, there are a lot of resources that our smaller partners require in terms of ensuring that we do have high quality, high integrity carbon projects that are also supporting nature and people. So we do need to get a whole ecosystem uh, going around that. So pricing carbon uh, sensibly, but also having the right investment vehicles and the right technical support vehicles for these projects to actually create the pipeline that we all need. Hmm. Thank you so much, Gabita, for that. I think there were two points there. One is the, um, you know, government support, um, you know, supportive policies around this, but also a supportive ecosystem as well. Uh, Ronnie, I wanted to go to you for this one. So um, as Kabita said, you know, a supportive ecosystem is essential for businesses and innovations to thrive. Um, and so how have you seen the nature-based solutions ecosystem develop in the region? And, you know, is this really sufficient to support the growth of nature-based solutions to its full potential? Yeah, thank you, Megan. Um, and I think thank you, Kavita, for touching on the ecosystem part. Um, because for our group, we we've always tried to come at our work from a field building perspective, which means looking at the ecosystem and looking at the gaps. And so I think for us, um, also leveraging leveraging our strengths as well, um, coming at it from a private investor or more from a private finance perspective. Um, so from our experience with convergence, that window which provided the feasibility proof of concept grants, these are very early stage kind of grants that um, to very early stage ventures as they design and think about their business model. And after one year or so into that, we quickly realized that to these ventures, even for example, like Fair Ventures, after they get this grant, after they prove the concept, um, they still need to go through a long journey until they can grow to a level where they would be attractive and viable enough business models to say the big fund managers banks that's coming in and mind you there's a lot of that money coming in right now um, uh, 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 whether it's from banks from fund managers I think some call 2021 as the year of biodiversity so a lot of capital no shortage of money and then you have the other spectrum which is um, facilities like ours that provides grants um, or, or even like in Singapore, I think we're seeing more of this pop up, these facilities, the grants facilities uh, that focuses even on biodiversity from Silver Strand Biodiversity Incubator, um, for example, and the, the, even the events like the livability challenge, Megan, that you mentioned, all of these are very conducive to very early stage kind of ventures getting off the ground design phase. There's a lot of technical assistance facilities. But what we found is there's a missing middle, which is from the point of their proof of concept to when these ventures are mature enough, there's this gap, this missing middle, where ventures will fall off. Um, and so what we decided to do was to develop what we call a nature venture builder that really looks at providing hands-on dedicated support to these ventures, um, very much focused on the commercial acumen side to give them and to to, to give them that support to enhance their business models, whether it is helping them think beyond just one or two revenue streams. For example, it's just rather than just timber, can you diversify to carbon credits? Can you diversify to certain uh, uh, payment for ecosystem services or ca other cash crops? So really making the business model more robust um, and then even making the basic operations tighter from, and also to governance, it could be to fundraising, uh, it could be doing the basic financial planning. So a whole host of things that helps to um, grow and scale these ventures, but on a very hands-on hands -on manner. And of course, there's a financial element where we will also invest money into it, but that's not that's not the, the most important part of it. Um, and, and so we think this venture builder will basically select and evaluate a few key ventures every year and provide this very dedicated long-term support, maybe over three to five years. Um, and that helps these ventures grow and scale um, to a point where they will become attractive. So that to us, we think is absolutely needed right now 
uh, to plug that gap in the ecosystem and to help build up viable uh, pipeline, which is really lacking and which a lot of the money that's coming in, whether it's funds or banks, that they're really looking at. Um, and so we're really excited. We 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 found uh, finally a CEO because I think mentioned talent is an issue. So pulling together the right team, a small team to do this, we found a CEO. So hopefully we can um, um, go to market by end of the year. But very excited about this. Um, and this venture build is very focused on Indonesia to begin with. Because um, we really want to start small and really bottoms up, but really hoping it can start small and fill that really critical gap to help build pipeline, build some talent as well um, uh, uh, within the space. And obviously working very closely with uh, local partners and NGOs. In fact, um, we are looking to partner with a big conservation NGO to do this, um, and as well as some big corporate foundations that's already kind of in the works that we're talking to. Again, it's more of an ecosystem play where we work with a network of people that share this mission and vision of ours to really plug this gap and help build up the ecosystem. Thank you so much, Ronnie. And, and again, great to hear everything that RS Group is doing in this venture builder. I, I'm going to go on to Park Eka, actually, staying on this on the same question of the supportive ecosystem being absolutely essential um, you know, for a nature-based solution innovation to thrive. Um, and Ronnie as well mentioned the missing needle middle, you know, where there is really no shortage of money in, in the market. It's just that um, you know ventures do fall off somewhere in the midway point, um, you know, not enough for them to kind of scale up to, to commercial reality. So in the Indonesian context, uh, what, what is being done to foster a more vibrant and supportive ecosystem for nature-based solutions? Okay, thank you. Uh, related about the coastal protection, uh, we still committed on our target in the mangrove restoration in 2024. Uh, we think uh, st uh, the mangrove is still the best uh, option and cost-effective option in wave integration to decreasing the erosion uh, caused by the waves. Uh, the other hand, we need to see whether the seawall is sustainable or uh, can be implemented in other coastal cities where the cost of uh, uh, rising about the sea level will be high. Furthermore, uh, various movement to increase the resilience, the reef seafront area as well uh, as the by carrying out mangrove forest uh, uh, in addition, the government also continues to educate coastal communities on the importance of maintaining, preserving awareness and early mitigation, so uh, coastal development can uh, will be more sustainable. I think that's uh, our uh, policy related about the uh, coastal protection. Thanks, Eka. Um, Kavita, would you like to also address, um, you know, what Eka has kind of um, uh, provided in terms of, um, you know, the issues related to conservation and protection of the coastlines, and then maybe we can go to the supportive ecosystem bit a little bit later on. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think you know we are uh, we are lucky to be in a region which has very high level of uh, ecosystems. So about you know fifteen percent of uh, the world's tropical forests are found in, uh, in in Southeast Asia and primarily in uh, Indonesia is the third largest tropical forest in the world. We have a coastline that is you know rivaled by no other uh, region. So we have a lot of mangroves and a lot of peatland. We have about you know uh, a third of the world's peatlands uh, in the region as well, and you know equally a third of the coral reefs. So you know, we have such unique ecosystems, and I think more and more what we are finding is that the blue carbon discussion is picking up um, and the need to be investing more in how do we uh, harness the uh, the mangrove especially is coming up but it's also seagrasses and seaweeds where we are seeing a lot of carbon storage uh, within these ecosystems so there's a obviously we need to measure and be sure that we understand how much is being sequestered but it's like it might not be big areas but it's very deep within that so you know if you look at some of the peatland uh, programs that we have, they have very high levels of carbon sequestration based on the depth of the peat and the and the ecosystem that we that we are trying to protect. So you know, more and more as we get into an understanding of the coastal ecosystems, uh, there is also very high level of uh, and you know, species around that. They act as nurseries, they act as protective areas, they uh, help with adaptation to climate change because you know the sea level rises and the insurgence of the sea and and all the weather patterns are much more protected from that. So there is a, an absolute need. Uh, and as Mark Eka was saying, you know, if we can get more of those protected areas uh, and then quantified in terms of carbon uh, and working with the coastal communities, 
we will definitely see a much higher rate of carbon uh, programs in uh, in Southeast Asia, and especially in Indonesia, which has over 7,000 uh, islands with its founders borders. Thanks, Kavita. And actually staying on that as well, um, in terms of a success nature-based case study that has already been implemented um, in Indonesia specifically, do you, do you have something to share on that? Yeah, absolutely. And in, in fact, there are, there are a few that we've been looking at. And I think, you know, one I can, both uh, examples I'll take very quickly from, uh, from Borneo, from uh, Kalimantan. Uh, and they are really looking at it in terms of the peat. As I was saying, we have very strong peatland. Uh, in the in the region with high sequestration uh, potential, so you're looking at Katinga, uh, Katinga Mentaya or uh, Rimbaraya, the two projects that we have. Both of them, you know, have very high spans of of, of land uh, within that. So if you look at uh, just uh, the uh, Katinga project, there are 157,000 hectares of uh, forest of tropical peatland within that, and uh, Rimbaraya is really looking at you know another. Uh, 47,000 hectares. So they're really large scale and both of them actually tend to be in areas which are orangutan habitats. So you can see about, you know, 10% of the world's orangutans live in those areas. And so if we can protect them, then we can get really good uh, uh, impact on our species as well, some of the most endangered ones. And of course, these are, you know, the highlight species, but we have, if you protect those, you will get a whole ecosystem of species. But more interestingly, it's also about the communities and both projects will talk to you about how much it has taken to really work with the communities uh, and really engage them, not just as uh, getting their rights signed away, which we're seeing in a lot of projects, but as equal partners so that they gain uh, in terms of the benefit from the sale of the carbon credit going to them, but also from the practices that they are then taught, whether it's you know, smallholder agriculture or something else that that enables them to uh, to really earn money. So I think you know there's there's like 34 villages in the Katinga project, like 200 other families in in, in Rimbaraya. But just to also say like these can also be buffer zones. I think Ronnie was talking about that as well. So where you have a huge spread of uh, of palm oils on one side and protected areas on the other side, you have these buffer zones that can really be mixed. So you start looking at product uh, production protection and restoration within that. I think the only thing I would add to that in, in, as we're looking at discussions is scale. So, you know, one of the things that we're looking at as, as, as high integrity, high quality carbon credits is whether you can look at a landscape level, so a jurisdiction uh, level, so that these projects are not at risk because the biggest risk of these projects is, uh, is uh, you know, permanence of the sequestration and the additionality of the work that we do. So these concepts then allow us within a jurisdiction to reduce the risk of the loss so that you can compensate for a loss one place uh, with another place within the same uh, broader geography. So some really interesting programs are, are being built. And I think uh, uh, some of the new ones are now on hold waiting for clearer regulations so that we can go ahead with the uh, blessing of the Indonesian government. Taking back to you, I'm not sure if we've lost you. I'm happy to continue to chat. <laughs> we may have lost her. No, I'm here. I'm here. Bye. Hello. <laughs> so sorry. I must apologize because I'm actually dialing in from my grandmother's place in Jakarta. So the Wi Fi is a little bit wonky. So <laughs> sorry about that. Um, but no, thank you, Kavita, for that. I think I caught, caught quite a few good points from what you just said. I think you mentioned communities and also, you know, the, the high quality in, in, and integrity of carbon credits as well, which I'll go on in a little bit. But, um, you know, we, we talked about community as well to make sure that, you know, uh, we're engaging them as equal partners as we implement these projects. So, Paeka, this question is for you. Um, we know about the climate change mitigation benefits of and, and of nature-based solutions. Um, and we also know a little bit about economic and the social benefits of wide-scale implementation as well. But how can countries such as Indonesia really ensure the inclusivity of indigenous communities, uh, which will be crucial to the successful, successful rollout of these plans? Okay, thank you. Uh, of course, uh, if we... Uh, uh, Tell about uh, uh, tell about the what we call it the <clears throat> climate change. Uh, of course, uh, natural based solution offer important economic gain. This include the job, cheaper, cheaper infrastructure, based business productivity, tourism and recreation value as uh, etc. And green or hybrid infrastructure can help to bridge into a multi trillion uh, dollar financing gap for the global in infrastructure. 
while the development of uh, green or hybrid infrastructure uh, may require more time and labor at the outset, and, and uh, this uh, kind this of investment tend not to uh, depreciate over time, uh, and if given time and space, will keep uh, will keep uh, growing. Uh, and you know, uh, we try uh, to implement the natural based solution uh, not only in national level, but uh, we try uh, to uh, uh, try uh, to implement into the sub national level. For example, in Bali, Bali as uh, we uh, uh, try in Bali as a pilot project. So if we look at in Bali, uh, Bali because, uh, because uh, during the pandemic. Bali is the most uh, contraction economy uh, in among uh, among province. Therefore, uh, we focus on how to develop Bali uh, in the medium and the long term. So, uh, in, in Bali, uh, we uh, uh, try to what we call it uh, make the target uh, uh, how to uh, implement like the green uh, economy and green Bali etc. etc. Uh, so uh, to achieve the national goal, we we uh, try to make the like a pilot project, like a Bali and the next the other provinces like that. So uh, based on the uh, pilot project, we can uh, we can get uh, like a lesson learned how to achieve like the uh, how to achieve the target and natural based solution. For example, uh, in Bali in 2045, there's no uh, motor uh, motorcycle from the uh, have the fuel from the fossil oil. All the motorcycle is coming from the electric vehicle. There's a there's a there's a target uh, uh, that we uh, implement uh, it in Bali. Thank you. Thank you so much, Enka. Uh, Enka, yeah. I wonder your thoughts on that as well. How how can countries ensure uh, you know the inclusivity of indigenous communities in implementing these plans? No, thank you for that question, Megan. I think it's really important because I think we are at the point right now where we're seeing various projects come online, uh, which claim to have engaged communities and got free and prior informed consent, but haven't really done that. Um, and I think you know, they may have gone and got signatures in half an hour, and these are communities that uh, have their own way of making decisions and own uh, way of like uh, ensuring that there's equity within that. So we really need to be engaging communities uh, first and foremost, on getting free and prior informed consent for them, any project that is done there, to understand the rights that they have. Many of these are very different types of rights. You know, you may not have uh, coherent land rights, but they have, um, you know, uh, traditional rights, or they have rights by being there, or these are community conserved areas. Uh, I think, you know, we need to really take the time to understand what rights do those communities have. Uh, and then we need to be very clear about saying if they are in that area and you know they are also the ones that are the ones who've been protecting those landscapes and, and do care very deeply about that from a very cultural and heritage perspective, but are also using it because they have some needs that they need, need to fulfill. Sometimes those needs can be counterproductive to the protection uh, agenda. So really working with them to say any solution that needs to be long-term needs to be based in a community engagement portfolio. So you need to be able to say that those communities buy in to the project that you're doing. And that takes a long time. Um, but projects will only be able to survive and deliver and meet the needs of uh, the communities, but also on the carbon side and the nature side and the biodiversity side, if everyone takes the time to, to go along. And of course, we must have benefit sharing from the outcome of that and should be equitable benefit sharing so that these communities actually uh, benefit not just you know from a handout or from just you know small percentage but as equal partners in any project that is being developed and we are really concerned that this has not been taken into account that it's becoming very much of a disempowered communities and an imbalance of power in these transactions so for long term uh, equitable uh, growth to meet our SDGs on poverty and to have long-term conservation uh, outcomes those community engagement from the get-go and uh, long term is absolutely critical. We're seeing that happen in really good projects, and that will now be written into like standards and uh, verification uh, systems, and also in high integrity uh, benchmarks. But I think you know we need uh, all of our project developers to pay a little more attention to that. 
Thank you so much, Kavita. I really like um, how you put that very much into one package for all of us to take home to kind of, you know, record that, that message and take home uh, and make sure that it's done. But you mentioned, you know, high quality, high integrity as well. So we know that, I guess, in spite of the popularity, you know, high quality nature-based carbon credits still remain quite a scarce commodity. Um, what, I mean, I, I'm sure a lot of, audience, a lot of the, the people in the audience as well, they don't really know what constitutes high quality. I must say that I probably as well don't know, really know that. Um, so what exactly constitutes high quality? or rather high integrity carbon credits and how can we ensure that these standards are met? It's a very live and very important question that we're dealing with now. So I think, you know, for example, uh, let me start with saying, what do we do right now? So if you're looking at high quality, very often it is about ensuring that the carbon uh, sequestration is, is correct. Uh, and how do you ensure that, you know, what you're claiming is actually uh, in fact, being taken out of the environment. So they're very clearly technical assessments that need to be done. It needs to be additional. So, you know, it's not that uh, it would have happened with no program. So if it's not at risk, it's not additional. It needs to be permanent. So it's not like it's going to get turned into a farm the next year or there's a fire that might burn it, which is possible. So you need to create buffer zones. There's no leakage. So it's not that you stop something from happening here and that deforestation or that agricultural production goes into another place. And so there's equivalence is, uh, you know, the benefit is equalized out, so there's no additional benefit. So there are these very technical things that that need to be absolutely put in place for it to be integral to a, uh, to a carbon credit. But also what we are trying to do is saying, even beyond that, uh, what does good look like? So the Integrity Council for Voluntary Carbon Markets, which I sit on the board for, has now been working with a lot of the standard setters and the verifiers to see how do we codify uh, this high quality, high integrity. So core carbon principles are being developed uh, along these technical skills that will then enable everyone to see even every standard is set against that. So you can assess the standard. But what we're really asking for in that is that these questions of, you know, the nature and people benefit. So it's nature positive and people positive uh, is an essential part of this and that you must have safeguards that ensure that uh, that we are uh, doing no harm, but even better, making nature and people better off as, as a result. Uh, and what we are doing to the additionality around core benefits uh, for the SDGs and, and beyond as well. So these elements are now being codified and are being road tested. And uh, well, they're in consultation right now to see that we can get it right, that we can agree them uh, with the standard setters and the verifiers, and that we can then implement it. So there's absolute clarity amongst all of us in terms of what we mean when we say high quality and high integrity. Thank you so much, Gavita. That's uh, again, very, very clearly put. Um, before I go to the Q&A box, I know Ping has put a question there, which I would love to, to pose to um, the panel speakers, really. But I wanted to go on to Ronnie from what Kavita just mentioned. Uh, we spoke about a little bit about, you know, innovative business models. And, and now Kavita has come in with, you know, the credibility of carbon credits as well. Um, how does the carbon market or the credibility of carbon credits affect the development of business models um, that would encourage investments into nature-based solutions? I, I know this is one that I've kind of randomly chalk to you as well. Why this kind of came up, I was wondering if I, I could give you some time as well to think about it or if you want to rephrase it in a way that, that, that you know, you would feel comfortable in answering. Yeah. Um, I guess it's, it's, it's not a binary relationship as well, isn't it? So I think it's how carbon credit markets affect corporates, but I think also how corporates demand and what they ask for and their needs affect the carbon credit market so it's like a demand and supply kind of relationship um, um and and obviously there's a lot of forces um even on both sides so i think to your point about how carbon credits affect so i think if if um you know i think what kavita was talking you know uh, so passionately about which is the need for high quality um uh, uh, carbon credits and to avoid any kind of that kind of or we've had used the word broadly greenwashing in the carbon credit sense, uh, avoid companies misusing and abusing, avoid um, the uh, a double counting, ensuring additionality, ensuring that capital is really going to the high risk areas, um, ensuring that local that communities don't don't um, don't lose out. Um, I think you know, for example, there are increasingly talks about biodiversity credits, which is a higher quality type of credits. So I think um, uh, that supply side, I think, obviously will affect 
how corporates look at it um, and, and the degree that corporates um, uh, want quality or, or what kind of carbon credits they, 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 they are actually looking for. But I think is the, uh, the other way is you know, how, how corporates um, uh, see, see carbon credits as well, because I think we touched upon how recently in Indonesia, there's some uncertainties regarding the regulations on um, on carbon credits and whether um, you can actually um, certify some of these carbon credits uh, to foreign buyers and whether these foreign buyers can account for it in their uh, carbon offset because uh, to ensure that it contributes locally to the um, national development goals of Indonesia. And so what corporates now and what the projects are doing now in response to that is instead of um, selling the traditional tradable certificates when it comes to carbon credits, um, they are looking for buyers who can claim um, say, say carbon, certain carbon um, credits from the, the projects that they invest or that they support um, as some kind of um, uh, um, um, uh, compensation for the for the um, emissions that they do, but without officially counting it towards the carbon offset reduction. Um, so it's a very soft and gray area, but we are look, we're seeing a lot of projects that's being crafted in this way. So again, back to that point is it really the demand and supply side is very closely related and it, and, 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 and the supply affects the, the bias, but then I think the bias demand will also craft what type of su uh, supply comes out. But I think from a regulation perspective, um, it's really important that we get this right as well. All those points that Kapita was talking about. Um, and I know in Singapore, um, that's what Tamasek and MAS and CIX now, um, they're really focusing on. Um, we actually um, uh, funded a, gave a grant to the National University of Singapore to uh, look into a fellowship that focuses on the Oxford principles um, of carbon credit. So ensuring that it's done in a responsible way, having a good balance between nature-based credits versus more climate tech related carbon credits. So there's a lot of, um, uh, uh, thoughts um, and developments and is changing really quickly as well, but definitely an interesting space and something that we really need to get right. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Rani, for that. Um, yeah, go ahead, Kavita. Yes, of course. Just, just to complete the picture, which Rani is so brilliantly laid out, I think one of just to mention that we also need to hold companies to account. Um, and we, you know, there is also another initiative, which is the voluntary carbon markets integrity initiative, which is basically saying companies that are buying carbon credits need to first ensure that they are following the mitigation hierarchy of reducing their emissions and increasing their efficiency so that carbon credits are the very last thing that they invest in, not the first thing that they use to reduce their carbon footprint, right? We, we have to get everyone to first reduce and then offset at the, at the very end. And so what claims they can make, how they are uh, you know, portraying their uh, carbon neutrality or net zero is also very important and under much scrutiny. Thank you, Kavita and, and, and Ronnie. I think both of you have been a very full picture of, you know, of the questions that I, I posed. But I wanted to stay on, you know, the high quality carbon credit point, but also bring in the previous, um, you know, conversation we had on local communities and indigenous people. What does a high quality carbon credit mean for local communities and indigenous um, communities as well? And, and for part, I can specifically, um, you know, how can how can you, uh, you know, government ensure that local communities are also factored into negotiations um, to avoid social conflict? Um, for this first part, the question, uh, Kavita, you know, would love for you to comment on that. And then for Eka to, to comment on the, uh, you know, factoring of these communities um, into negotiations. It's a very difficult one. There's no easy answer to this, Megan. But I think where we are looking at the uh, at what high quality looks like is is on a few elements. Uh, first is you know a clear engagement strategy uh, for communities. Second is looking at free and prior informed consent, which is an actually a formal process. It's not just going and getting a certificate. It's actually a whole process of engagement and uh, and uh, getting them to agree and be partners in that. Third is very clear benefit sharing with the community so that they are actually getting a you know, high percentage of the benefit uh, that uh, that they accrue from the uh, from the carbon sale uh, that that you might have. So these are just very basic things that we're trying to write into the uh, High Quality Integrity Council uh, guidelines for carbon principles. Uh, but then, of course, you can go over and beyond that uh, in engaging them and looking at how we might actually go 
put those as additional co-benefits that companies and other buyers will be willing to pay higher price for. So you could look at gender, you could look at youth, you could look at the elderly, you could look at job creation beyond carbon. So there's a lot of elements, uh, you know, coming from the SDGs that should be all uh, built into this as additional benefits from carbon projects. Thank you, Kavita. And Eka would love for you to comment on, on, that, on that as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe uh, uh, maybe I want to uh, raise about that the others uh, example related about that how we uh, develop a nature based uh, a solution. Uh, uh, the most important thing is a uh, uh, collaboration between government, corporate scientists, and civil society is the successful uh, of the nature based solution at scale. So uh, maybe I want to give the example uh, in that Indonesia. Uh, still uh, push about it, how do we develop a geopark? Uh, Indonesia has carried out the many projects related to uh, nature-based solution, one of which uh, the development of geopark uh, in line with UNESCO uh, goals. Uh, we see that a uh, geopark is a single geographical uh, area or combination that has geosite and valuable natural landscape related to geoheritage, Geodiversity, biodiversity, and cultural diversity, and manage for uh, conversation purposes, education, sustainable community, economic development with active involvement of the community and local government. So it is uh, uh, can used by uh, to foster public understanding and concern for the earth and surrounding development. Uh, we uh, have a target about the national action goal, uh, goal for the Geo Park 2025 is to preserving the earth, prospering human being, human being. To achieve that, uh, we have committed to establish a 31 geopark, uh, uh, geopark master plan, and uh, we uh, have the inter, uh, 16 new international geo, uh, geological heritage design, and etc. That's uh, maybe we can. Uh, that's uh, the other example of uh, how to. Uh, the real action related about that nature-based solution ecosystem. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eka. Um, and, and I guess actually specifically to Indonesia as well, um, you know, sub, sub national levels such as provinces and your districts as well are seen as quite um, strategic levels of governance for achieving sustainability in part close to, you know, close engagement with the communities and small businesses as well. So how are these sub national levels of governments working together to promote uh, you know, nature based solutions implementation in each region? Okay. Uh, uh how to uh, synchronize uh, the most uh, difficulties uh, yes i agree how to synchronize about the national level at the subnational level therefore uh, we have a several coordination uh, meeting uh, start from the uh, regional uh, we, we call it the uh, bottom up uh, bottom up uh, what we call it bottom up mm... approach Yes, bottom up approach and top down approach. We call it the Musren Bang Nas. Uh, we uh, before we uh, setting about that or formulate about that uh, planning document, we started from the bottom up level approach. This is uh, from the village uh, about that. Uh, after that, uh, go to kabupaten uh, cities as uh, kabupaten kota. We call it the what we call it the regency and cities and province. After that, we discuss about that. Uh, the input from the bottom up into the uh, to the we have the meeting uh, the national level. So in the national level, we uh, combine uh, the input from the but uh, from the bottom up and the top uh, level. So after that, we have the conclusion and we put in the uh, planning document, planning document uh, in the annual, uh, medium term, and the long term. That's uh, how to we synchronize about that. Uh, the the uh, the needs from the uh, sub national level and the national level. Thank you so much, Eka, for shedding some light on, on, on that, that point. Um, I'm going to go to the chat now. Um, Simon has put a question in earlier on. Um, and I think maybe Kavita and, and Ronnie will be able to, 
to um, comment on this. So MBS appears worthy and a valuable principle, but when the means we use to build things, grow stuff, and develop all require financial transactions, how do you actually identify specific nature-based solutions benefits and measure the financial value in terms that businesses or governments will accept? It is. Yeah. Rani? Yes, yeah, so uh, maybe I can give it a go first. Um, uh, I think the first thing to keep in mind is um, the finance piece to these um, businesses or these ventures or these business models is really a tool. Um, it's definitely not the end of it. It's a tool to um, generate um, financial sustainability or to ensure financial sustainability to enable the conservation or restoration of these um, places, whether it's forests or uh, marine areas or, or sea, um, because conservation has traditionally been really funded by grants. And I think um, the idea of um, these business model is to reduce the reliance on grants, not, not completely wipe it out, but reduce, and to uh, allow business models so that the projects themselves can generate income so that you can continue to conserve the land. So I think when we think about the finance piece or the structuring piece, yes, it can get very complicated and I'm not a fan of that um, at all. Um, uh, but all of that is really should be seen as a tool, an instrument to enable these structures to self-sustain from a financial perspective. So I think that's the first point. Um, the other point I think is um, uh, in terms of the benefits, again, thinking about what's causing um, the need for the conservation in the first place. There's two key things, right? I might know there may be more. So one, the way we see is the possibly the local communities. Um, this is why there's so much emphasis on local communities, um, possibly because of the fact that they've been pushed out of their land or they're forced into positions where they have to um, care about their own livelihoods of themselves and their families. So they're forced to encroach on land that um, was for conservation or they, they, they somehow um, uh, uh, due to unsustainable farming practices that may not have been their own fault uh, that they've been forced to do that has caused the degradation of land. Um, so, so, so that's one one piece. So, ensuring how do you find um, and or whether it's alternate livelihood incomes or engaging them in the conservation work, so as that they can substitute and reduce their incentive to degrade um, or to or increase the incentive for them to use the land sustainably. So that's that's why engaging local communities is so important. The other piece is corporates, right? Um, so. Again, we think about what's causing a lot of the deforestation is the supply chains of corporates that has, you know, exploited the land um, or have been doing land grabs. So I think really targeting the sustainable supply chains of these companies is really important. Um, and so when we talk about benefits, um, it, it it really is still the same set of benefits that you're looking at, which is this conservation. You're looking at the number, the scale of the land that you can conserve. And with that, what is the carbon sequestration that you can uh, you could have avoided or you could have restored if it's a restoration project. Um, so it's really bound to the basics of conservation. Uh, when it comes to the social element is um, you still be measuring in terms of the local communities, whether it's number of people, the, uh, the, the kind of income levels, I think Kavita touched upon that a bit, um, and, and the general um, communities that, that you can continue to build uh, around um, these areas. Uh, and, and so I think the, 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 the measurement part, the impact part will come really naturally or is really back to the basics of what it should have been. Um, and so there's nothing too tricky about that. But I think that that the local community and the corporate um, uh, uh, pieces have to be really well addressed in order to ensure that conservation and these models can really sustain. Thank you, Ronnie. That, that was a very good shot at the question. And Kavita. Well, Ronnie has done a great job, so I don't have much to add. But I think the only thing just to emphasize from what she said is, it's not easy. So I think one of the things that we're finding from a conservation and, and, and uh, environment perspective is that what we might value as you know, clean air, uh, clean water, uh, even medicinal value that these forests have is the life cycle of, uh, um, of life that we have is not yet uh, being monetized uh, and being 
you know, put into uh, the economic value that companies and governments might be looking for. We're still finding it difficult. How do you put a value to a tiger uh, being alive in the forest in, in, in Malaysia? But without that, without that tiger, you will not have the entire ecosystem because of the absolute predatory uh, environment that it creates and, and hence the trigger down that it has. Uh, so in fact, the carbon market is one of the few ways that we can actually value standing forests and the inherent biodiversity in them and other ecosystems as well. So this is a problem. And I think as uh, Ronnie was saying, we're now trying to say, well, the, this has an economic value for the community. It has an economic value uh, for agriculture. or It has an economic value for other ancillary units that we might be doing is the way that we're going as, as proxies. So we still have a long way to go ourselves to actually make that business case and that clear value proposition, economic value proposition, though the conservationist in me says that we should be able to value these things for the value that they bring, which does not always need to be put down into monetary terms. And that's not the only measure of value that we should be using, but I think we're a far way away from that. I like that, Kavita, that, you know, the, 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 the way of measuring should not only be a monetary value. Uh, Paika, do you have any uh, last words on this one before I go on to the final question for all of you? Are you on mute, Paika? Sorry. Sorry. Uh, related about that, uh, uh, what we call it, the uh, economic benefit for about the NBS. Uh, NBS offer essential social and environment services. Uh, this range of uh, can get from the cleaner air and water, increased habitat for angel and uh, the endangered species, and etc. Et uh, uh, but uh, I realized that is it very difficult, yeah. For uh, especially we uh, now in the economic recovery uh, from the pandemic. So uh, the most important thing how to make a balance between uh, economics. Uh, side and the uh, environment side this is uh, what uh, what this is a big challenges for for us therefore uh, but uh, you know uh, this is uh, we agree that green economy or nbs is a one game change one of the game changer uh, after covid covid so we cannot uh, grow sustain sustain without uh, concerning about that uh, about that nbs Therefore, uh, in our uh, document, our, our planning or document, we set some target related about, uh, for example, like the uh, uh, green uh, houses gases. Uh, we, we, we put in the, the target in the medium term and the uh, annual plan. So uh, uh, the, how to implement it? Of course, uh, we have the regulation. So uh, for example, uh, for the industry, Maybe we have uh, put uh, some incentive that the for uh, for the industry that have the implemented about that uh, for example like the emissions and like that for example about the now we try to reduce about that uh, the how to use about the coal we 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 we, we started into the uh, green uh, for example like a solar panel or uh, maybe um, a gases and something like that that have uh, lower about the emission. So uh, some uh, regulation or some uh, restriction that have been pushed uh, to the industry that to, to implement about that uh, green, uh, green uh, what we call it, NBS. So we hope about that uh, regulation, we can uh, make a balance between the economic side and the uh, environmental side. This is what we do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eka. And, and with that, our uh, time has passed by so quickly and we're to the end. We just want to pose one more final question to all the speakers. And this will be a short, uh, you know, keep it within one minute kind of question. Um, if there's one thing we could do to achieve Indonesia's nature-based um, solutions, potential and ambition, what would it be? I'm going to go from Eka to Ronnie to Kavita. Eka? Wait. Uh, hmm. If you even Friday, I can go to Ronnie first. No. Yeah. Hello? Okay, I'll go to Ronnie first. Can you hear me? Hello? Oh yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Are you okay? Okay. Yes. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh related, related about the question. Uh maybe uh we have uh, three uh 
crucial step. First about that raise understanding of the value of nature. Policymakers need to better understand the value of natural capital like mangroves and other ecosystems that provide important benefit for the communities. And the second one uh, related about embed a uh, natural-based solution into climate adapt adaptation planning. Nature-based uh, solution often work best when people use them at larger scales across whole, uh, whole landscape, ecosystem, or cities. Government uh, are of best place to plan climate adaptation in this scale, given their access to resource and ability to make policy and coordinate among uh, multiple actors. To be successful, uh, they should include nature-based solution in their adaptation planning from the start. And the last one related about the uh, encourage uh, investment in nature-based solution. Communities and countries often uh, access to funding as a barrier to implementing uh, nature-based solution and to climate uh, and adaptation effort overall. But uh, uh, we, uh, uh, but government can spur investment in this approach by reorienting their policy subsidies and public investment. They all they can also better incentive uh, for the private investor to to finance adaptation project. I think uh, that's uh, my answer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eka. Uh, and, and Ronnie? Sure. So I can maybe pick up from Eka's point about private investors, and that's exactly the angle that we're coming from. Um, so for us, it's two, two key things. Um, um, I, I don't know if this is the third one, but from our perspective, one is the pipeline, building the pipeline of viable business models that is strong, that we think will be attractive to, to investors or private investors. Often these uh, pipeline projects would take a blended finance structures. Uh, where there would be some form of concessionary capital that can help de-risk and increase the risk-adjusted retail, returns so as to be um, attractive to investors from a return perspective. But obviously, there's other elements of the business model that needs to be uh, robust enough, again, to be attractive. So we're really focused on that through the nature venture builder that I mentioned earlier on, that we think is a fundamental piece to the ecosystem, as well as from the private investor uh, uh, mobilizing for a private investor perspective. The other quick one, if I can say one more, is uh, always stress at the end of the day is all about people, whether it is um, the entrepreneurs that's um, doing these ventures or um, it is experts on, on, on the investor side to understand what these ventures are and even developing ta uh, talent through education very early on in schools and, and university programs, allowing fellowships to happen so as to provide career opportunities and training for um, candidates who are interested. So the young talent side, we think that's absolutely crucial. Thank you. And last but not least, uh, Kavita. I can round that up very quickly and saying what we do need is very clear government policies and support for these projects. Um, and we do need a good sense of uh, investment and it's probably going to be blended finance, but hopefully the price of carbon and other uh, services will truly reflect the cost of doing uh, of these projects. Thank you, Eka, Kavita, and Ronnie for providing your insights on today's discussion. Uh, we talk about various topics from the challenges of implementing nature-based solutions, the importance of engaging with local communities to ensure an equal partnership, clear government policies that's needed to drive the way forward, the talent that we need to develop, to develop innovative business and investment models to unlock finance to nature-based solutions, and last but not least, the importance of credible and high-integrity carbon credit and scaling nature-based solutions. I think it's very safe to say that we are working today from today's session with a deeper understanding on how Indonesia and countries can uncover its full potential for nature-based solutions, how stakeholders' interests can be synthesized both horizontally and vertically to make this happen, the solutions to implementation barriers, and most of all, the opportunities the country will gain from realizing its full nature-based solutions potential. But before we close the session, speakers, please bear with me for just three seconds to take a group shot. Um, ben will be here to take a, a shot for us in, give you five seconds, four, three, two, and one. And with that, thank you, speakers, because now we have come to the end of our dialogue. 
Kavita, Eka, and Bonnie, it was such a pleasure to have you and for audience as well for making the time to be with us this afternoon. I hope all of you found this conversation as enlightening as I did. Please do send a, uh, spend a few minutes to answer, um, I think, a post-event survey that will be shown to you, that will be sent to you. And don't forget to use our hashtags, um, EcoBusiness, eco EB Conversations, if you are sharing your thoughts on this session via social networks. And for now, but for now, I'm going to say uh, goodbye to everyone and have a great evening ahead. And I hope to see you in the next virtual event that we will have soon.